Thank you for your interest here at North Hills, where we are more than Sunday. If you have any questions or would like to know more about our ministries, you can always visit us online at north-hills.org. Now join us as Pastor James delivers his message. Well, good morning. So I really love to shop at Ikea. Anybody in here love to shop at Ikea? I love Ikea because they have some cheaper stuff, but that comes with a catch. You see, they sell it to you, but you have to put it together yourself. Now, what I love about that is I actually like to build things, but I have one small problem with Ikea, is Ikea gives you extra stuff. They give you a couple extra screws, because there are people out there, and I'm not one of these people, that loses stuff. You know, that screw runs off, goes down something, you can't get it, so you got the extra. And you're putting it together, so if you're like me, and not tooting my own horn here, but I don't like not using parts. So you get done, it's complete, so you got these leftover parts. And here's my problem with this. What do you do with those leftover parts? What do you do with them? Some people throw them away. Not me, because you never know. I don't know what you use, but I have this container in the garage that's just filled with leftover parts. It's not just Ikea. It's not just these other, you know, it's Target. It's any place you got to put something together. Why? I don't know why I keep it. But the reality is, is that they had a purpose. These parts had a purpose. And for me, anything that has a purpose, it's hard for me to throw away. It's hard for me to throw something away that has a purpose. You see, anything that is made, anything that is created, has a purpose. Think about that for a second. Anything that is created has a purpose. Think of all the things that are created. Think of all the things that that are made. You, You talk about cell phones, iPads, this chair. Stool was created. It has a purpose. The only things that don't have a purpose are things that are accidents, things that came up out of nowhere. This is my problem with the world when it comes to people who say that Christians or that people just kind of evolved from one giant accident. If we weren't created, we don't have a purpose. But the reality is is that We as followers of Jesus and 96% of the world's population, regardless of religion, believes that people were created. Were created and therefore if you are created, you have a purpose. The question of course is, and everybody is asking this question, it doesn't matter if you are a believer in Jesus, Muhammad, If you are a Buddhist, a Hindu, it doesn't matter. Everybody wants to know the answer to this question. What is my purpose? What am I here for? We've been in this series called Hello, My Name Is. What is a name but a way that identifies you, that tells the world who you are? And we've traced it from the beginning. Birth, our beginning, we're all born nameless. We're all born with essentially a blank slate. Yes, we bring a lot to that. We don't choose who we're born to. We don't choose the country we're born into or the religion of our parents, but we are born nameless. We get our name as we go older. Then we got to experience. We find our identity and our names in the things that we do, the good things that we do, the successes, the triumphs, the careers, The wife, the husband, the 2.5 kids, a dog, and a white picket fence. But also, the negatives are regrets. The painful experiences that we have, the victimhood. And then last week, we talked about the identity crisis, where you realize that all the things that you were living for were wrong. Or maybe not wrong, but they were not the whole truth. And we, we climbed into that chrysalis or cocoon as we, as we wrestled with, who am I? And is there something bigger than this? 
or is it all just what I see? Is there a God who loves me? Is there a Christ, a Savior who died for me? As we kind of think about this, we thought about how our beginning doesn't determine our end. Just because you're born a certain way doesn't mean you've got to end that way. We talked about how your identity defines what you do, not the other way around. You're not defined by what you do, but your identity defines what you do. And last week we talked about how in order for us to move forward with our identity, we have to embrace that identity crisis and leave our past behind. So now what? Now what? Maybe say we've done that. We, we've embraced the future. Now we want to leave the past behind. What do we move forward into? And today we come to this word, this P word, this beautiful word that many of us have looked for our whole lives and it's finally here an answer to what life is all about. Hello, my name is Purpose. So we think about what is the purpose of life? Many people ask this question. Many people have a lot of different answers. Some people literally say there is no purpose. That is a very sad thought. That the reality of life is there is no purpose. You just go through it from birth to death and that's it. That's a scary thought to me. Some people think purpose of life is just to get through life. Look out for yourself. Make as much money as you possibly can and die rich. But you can't take any of it with you. Some people think the purpose of life is success. When we think about today, millions of people around the world are going to watch a couple hundred people playing a game of football, most of these people under the age of 40. The reason I say 40 is because Tom Brady is getting there. Everybody else, we, we spend so much time focused on a bunch of 20-year-olds running around with a football. And you know what's sad is that most of those guys spent their entire life thinking their purpose was football. But what happens when you're 35 years old, your entire life has been about football, and nobody wants to sign you anymore? And you know what the reality is? We say, well, they make millions and millions of dollars, and most of them are broke within five years after leaving the league. What is your purpose? Is it to go to college, get a good education so you can get a good job? I graduated from college in 2004, right in the midst of the Great Recession. They said, go to college, you'll get a good job. There were no jobs. What is your purpose? What happens when you think your purpose is all about something, but then one day you just realize, okay, the dream is over. And it's not just sports. People spend their entire lives focusing on being an actor or an actress, trying to make it in Hollywood, but they never make it. What happens then? Have they not reached their purpose? Maybe they were looking in the wrong places. When we come today to this idea of purpose, we look at it at a very specific thing, and when we're talking about this today, I, I want us to see that there's two things here that we have to understand. One is that there is an ultimate purpose that all of us have. We all have the purpose that we were created by a God to worship him. And most of the world will never achieve that purpose unless we go out and tell them. But beyond that, if we have gone through this, if we've gone through our birth and our experience and we make it to that identity crisis and we realize there's a, there's a savior who loves me and I choose to follow Jesus with all of my heart for the rest of my life, then what? What is your purpose as a follower of Jesus? Let's find out. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verses 16. Now, you know, for the last four weeks, or the last three weeks, we have spent most of our time in the first two verses of this, this passage. We've read the whole thing, but we spent most of our time in the first two verses. And those first two verses are, 
from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And we've talked about these two verses in the context of how the world seeks to put labels on us about our identity. This is who the world says you are. The world says that you are successful if you make a lot of money, have a lot of stuff. And the world gives you that identity. And then we look at, you know, our life experience, the things we've accomplished. And the world says, okay, you've accomplished that, you've arrived, good, you may have this identity now. But again, the world puts on these negative things like, well, you're a failure. You're not good enough. You didn't measure up. You're worthless. These are these worldly perspectives, these worldly identities, these worldly labels that we put on other people and we allow other people to put on us. And Paul is saying, stop. There are two identities in this world. There are those who have found their identity in Christ and those who have not. There are those who have found their identity in following Jesus and those who have not. Those are the only two labels that we can put on people and that we can allow put on us. But then we come to the rest of this verse in this message. Because unless you've embraced Christ as your Savior, unless you have had that identity crisis where you've determined that the, what the world said you were is not what you are and you are going to leave the past behind and you are moving forward to the future, unless you've done that, the next verses do not apply to you. And I don't mean that to sound harsh, but they don't. Because you can't do this unless you've already found your identity in Jesus. So let's go on. Verse 18. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Some powerful words from Paul to the believer about what is your purpose. As you might recall over the last couple weeks, I, I've, I've shown you this illustration in nature and how in nature sometimes God gives us this picture of what it means to believe in him. He gives us this in Romans chapter one. He says that all of God's invisible attributes have been showed clearly through what has been made. And I think a very vivid picture of the transformation that a follower of Jesus has made through their life can be shown in the life cycle of a butterfly. And as you remember, we started with the eggs. Just a bunch of eggs on a small leaf, very small, you wouldn't even see them as you walked by them. But you realize that not every egg hatches, that many of these eggs will get eaten. But maybe, just maybe, they'll live. They'll hatch to become a caterpillar. And this caterpillar starts out small, but its entire life, its entire period of time that it is a caterpillar is all about doing one thing and one thing only, and that's eating as much as it possibly can. Some of us can relate to that. Eat as much as you possibly can. Because we love food. I love food. But that's not what life is about. Life is more than food. And then the caterpillar comes to that stage in his life where I told you last week that it begins to change almost without its help at all. It begins to have this change on the inside, this change that causes it to maybe question, to maybe think, is there more than this? 
The chrysalis begins on the inside, and as it begins, the caterpillar begins to, to make a transformation on the outside. And it goes into a chrysalis, where for three days it dies. And then after that third day, it becomes a butterfly. Now what? Now what? So you're a butterfly. Now what? What do you do now? So you're a follower of Jesus now. Now what? We get to that point in our lives was, okay, now what? This was fun. Now what? Here's our big idea for today. If life has purpose, then we need to be purposeful in the way that we live it. Life has purpose, we need to be purposeful in the way that we live it. A lot of times, many of us, and myself included, we go through life assuming that everything is an accident. Sometimes we think our birth was an accident. Sometimes we think the experiences that we have in life are accidents. That everything's random, nothing makes sense. And we can embrace that kind of chaos of life or we can accept that all things have a purpose. Whether or not that purpose is to grow us, to challenge us, to stretch us. Somebody once told me, if you want God to give you patience, don't ask for patience. Because God will not give you patience, he will give you scenarios that will test your patience. If we want to grow, we need to see life as not accidents, but opportunities. Opportunities for us to live it out purposefully. What is the purpose of a butterfly? Well, our main point, first point today is butterflies fly. Now that might seem rather elementary to some of you, but butterflies fly. That's what they were made to do. Think about that in relation to us. When we choose to follow Jesus, followers of Jesus were also meant to fly. Now, how does that relate? Well, when you're a follower of Jesus, you're meant to have this relationship with God. You're meant to fly, as it were, before God daily. God created you to, to please him, to bring glory to him. And we glorify God when we embrace that. Now, let me talk about this in terms of what, what Paul said. Christ has reconciled us to God. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we need to continue to earn our relationship with God? Does it mean that we need to, okay, now I've embraced Jesus, I'm following Jesus, but I still have to make up for all that stuff I did in the past? Does, do I still have to make up for all of the, the bad stuff? Do I still need to earn that standing before God? Do I still need to do enough stuff that God will accept me? And the reality is, is that followers of Jesus have been reconciled to God past tense which means we don't have to continue to focus on our past to earn it. We don't need to focus on making up for the things that we did. We don't need to even focus on all of the negative things we do now. What we simply need to do is to embrace our relationship with God now. We need to begin to develop that relationship to meet regularly with God, to come to worship God, to read his word, and to pray to him. We need to spend every waking minute acknowledging that we are now children of the one true king. Ephesians 3, 11 through 12, Paul tells us, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Because of what Christ did, we can boldly come before 
the throne of God. We don't have to be afraid. Now think about that butterfly. That butterfly was a caterpillar. Caterpillar becomes a chrysalis, and then that first moment where that butterfly peeks its head out of the chrysalis, it's different now. It's changed. What does the butterfly have that the caterpillar doesn't? Has wings. But does the butterfly trust those wings? Does the butterfly know now that it can fly? Does it trust that when it steps off that leaf for the first time and flaps its wings that it's going to fly? I don't know what a butterfly thinks, but I think many of us carry over from our old life into the new life this fear of coming before God. We carry this fear that, okay, God's not going to accept me. Maybe you were raised in that, that, that denomination or that, that faith background that said, you are always one step from God giving up on you. Maybe they never said that, but they put that fear into you. And all we need to acknowledge is now we can boldly come before God. We can bring glory to God, not because of what we do, but what Christ has done. So when I talk about butterflies fly, followers of Jesus do not have to be afraid of falling. We simply spread our wings and fly. And through that, we bring glory to God. How crazy would it be for the butterfly to try to become a caterpillar again? Or even stranger to walk around on the ground from place to place? Because if you do that, I would say, don't you know you can fly? The second thing that butterflies do is butterflies multiply. When you think about a butterfly coming out of the chrysalis for the first time, the very first thing that it does is flap, it wing, flap its wings and fly. The second thing that it does is it lays eggs. Now, I was reading online about butterflies and the scientists believe that they lay eggs immediately because their biological imperative tells them that they're very likely to get eaten by a bird within a very few short hours of their life. So in order to propagate the species of caterpillars and butterflies and the larva, the chrysalis, they lay eggs immediately. This, I think, is a very important picture for followers of Jesus to see. What is the purpose of following Jesus? It is to multiply. We are, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 15, the second part of 15 and 19, we were given the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and trusting to us the mission of reconciliation. Now, when you follow Jesus, there's this growth period, and many of us come at it with not a whole lot of knowledge and not a whole lot of information. And for whatever reason, we, we climb in ourselves, we say, okay, I gotta go find out about what this means before I tell anybody. We have to go find out um, what it means to follow Jesus, learn about the Bible, and then I'll go and share my faith. But actually, what I found is that the opposite is true. Some of the people I know who are the most fervent in telling other people about Jesus are new believers. They've had this, this transformation in their life. They've experienced this great joy and overwhelming sense of purpose. That one of the first things that they do is they want to tell people about it. They have no idea what it means to follow Jesus, but they know this is what it means. This is good news. That's what the gospel means, good news. I've experienced good news. I have to tell the good news. Let me tell somebody, and they can't keep it in. But as time goes on, for whatever reason, many of us, we lose that. We lose that desire to tell other people about Jesus, to tell other people what it means to follow Jesus, to tell other people what has happened to me. 
the most powerful story you can tell somebody to convince them of the joy of following Jesus is not any story that's particularly in the Bible, but it's a story that you have, the story that you carry with you of how God and the Bible have changed you. And when you tell that story with boldness, people have to listen. Because many people, when they, when they have that crisis, and they come out the other side following Jesus, it is a transformation that cannot be denied. And people want to know, what happened to you? and What have you done with fill in the name? It's a beautiful picture of change. When we follow Jesus for the first time, we can't lose that because our purpose is to multiply. Our purpose is to tell others. And then our purpose is to help those others, those new followers of Jesus, grow in their faith. Does that mean that you have to be perfect? Does it mean that you have to, to do, you know, everything right and, and make yourself look? No, actually, you have more credibility if you are still stuck wrestling with your old nature. Because you can come along somebody, say you were once, we'll, we'll just use alcoholic for example. When you become a follower of Jesus and you leave that alcoholic lifestyle behind, does that mean that you're no longer gonna struggle with that and that you have to say, I've overcome it? No, because what happens when you come alongside another guy who's struggling with that and you say, you know what? I struggle with that too. I know what it's like, I know what you're going through. I struggle, I fail, I pick myself up, but I have found somebody to follow who's leading me out of it. Would you allow me to hold you accountable to this and would you hold me accountable? That's what discipleship is. Discipleship is this interdependency between followers of Jesus. As the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. We need each other. No one was ever meant to follow Jesus by themselves. It's what's important about the church. We multiply, one by one. One person to another person, that person to another person. And we grow the church exponentially. That's how it's always been done. It's never been programs. It's never been worship services where we all come and then we do an altar call and people come down the aisles in droves to give themselves to Jesus. It's always been one person to one person. The third point and the last thing is that butterflies beautify. Butterflies are beautiful creatures. You think about that. Why is there so much beauty in the world? particularly the natural world, you look at a butterfly, you look at the patterns on its back. Why is a butterfly beautiful? What purpose does the beauty of the butterfly bring in a, in a strictly biological sense? Now, I guess I, I'm told that, that the different patterns tell you whether or not it's male or female. The different patterns um, <clears throat> camouflage it. But the reality is, is that butterflies are beautiful creatures, and they bring beauty into the world around them. Butterflies bring beauty. It's one of their purposes. Now, followers of Jesus, the church, are supposed to do the same thing. We're supposed to bring beauty into a very ugly world. Jesus said, we are salt and light. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for for Christ. What does it mean to be an ambassador? You're a representative. When our ambassadors go to other countries, when their ambassadors come to our country, we, they bring the beauty of their culture and their country to us. And we take the beauty of our culture of our country to them. 
you show the beauty and the majesty of that kingdom or that country in the midst of a different culture. As followers of Jesus, we bring the beauty of Christ into the world. We bring the beauty of what Christ has done into the world. And how does that bring about itself? What does it look like? Well, the first thing is it's the way that you live your life. When people look at you and they see you, they see God. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. They may see your good works and they will bring glory to your Father who's in heaven. And then there's the sense of the whole church, the whole body. In John 13, 35, Jesus says again, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By the things that we do, the good things, the good works, by the way that we treat each other as a church, not just this church, but the larger church, we bring glory to God in heaven. We beautify the world around us. Now, it's not about drawing attention to yourself. A butterfly isn't beautiful so they can say, look at me, I'm a butterfly, I'm beautiful. It's not about drawing attention to yourself, but about bringing that beauty into ugly places. I want you to think about this picture of baptism, because on, on February 19th, we're having a baptism service. And baptism, as many of you know and have heard over and over and over again, is an outward symbol of an inward change. Now, baptism is this picture of you identifying with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Baptized into the death, raised to newness of life. Now I want you to think about this for a second. Who is baptism for? Is it for the person getting baptized? Does that baptism do anything for them at all? It doesn't. It doesn't save you. It doesn't do anything. So you say, well, well, well pastor, why would I get baptized if it, if it doesn't do anything for me? Because it's not about you. Baptism is not about me, it's not about you. Baptism is a living, walking testimony to the unbeliever in the place of worship that tells them what it means to follow Jesus. That's what baptism is all about. Yes, it's commanded, but it's commanded not for you. Baptism is always for the group and for the church. So you may be holding out, saying, well, I don't need to get baptized. What is that? You need to because we need you to. We as a church need to see that change because there are people who also need to do that themselves. They need to follow Jesus because baptism is a beautiful picture that brings beauty to an ugly place. It's a testimony. So, butterflies fly. Followers of Jesus are confident before God. Butterflies multiply. Followers of Jesus are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Butterflies beautify. Followers of Jesus bring their light, their good works, into dark places. And you think, and I'm seeing this everywhere as I look. Confident faith to come before God and to love God. Multiply is about serving others. And bringing beauty changes the world around you. That sounds familiar. What's our mission statement here at North Hills? We're to love God, to serve others, and change the world. What is the purpose of a follower of Jesus? To love God, to serve others, and change the world. 
and it's right there in Scripture. But I do want to remind you that when we talk about following Jesus, it's a talking about looking forward. But what about the past? Don't we still have to acknowledge the things that were done in the past? Don't we still have to acknowledge those things that that we did that maybe we haven't reconciled for? Don't we have to deal with it? Well, yeah. You can't just, you know, if you robbed a bank and then the next day gave your life to Jesus, I'm not gonna say you're no longer, you know, held to the consequences, of course. Like Paul tells us, the old has passed away. Or as we said last week, the old is passing away. It is passing away. And the more that you let it pass away, the more that it will pass away. So you have to let it go. Following Jesus is just about just as much about letting go of the past even after the identity crisis stage as it is about following Jesus in the newness of life now. We continually let it go. We're gonna continue to struggle with it, so we continually let it go. But how do we best do that? Focus on your purpose. It's all about purpose. What is your purpose? As we go into this time of reflection, I want you to think about this question. What is your purpose? When you came in, I, I, there was a, a second name tag for you. And what I'd like for you guys to do is you write on your name tag, what is your purpose? You know, following Jesus, yeah, it's about loving God. But we love God in different ways. Some of us love God through our service. Some love God through our music. Some worship God through a variety of different ways. One thing that, that I find interesting is a lot of people feel like that they can, you know, serving God is all about being a pastor, being a missionary. But what if you, in your career, now remember, you're not identified by your career anymore, you're identified by being a child of God. But what if rather than being a, a, a teacher who also followed Jesus, we reverse that and now you're a follower of Jesus who's a teacher. How much more will you be purposeful in your teaching? Or maybe you're an accountant who follows Jesus. Now it's you're a follower of Jesus who's an accountant. Or an electrician. Now you're a follower of Jesus who's an electrician even as a pastor, I'm a follower of Jesus who just happens to be a pastor. So as we reflect today, I want you to write down on this, this thing, what is your purpose? What is your purpose in following Jesus? What specific skill set, what specific things do you bring that make you unique in loving God? What about serving others? What about that multiply? What ways is your purpose in sharing your faith? If you're a parent, your number one is your kids. How will you be purposeful in sharing your faith with your kids? But it can't stop there because there's a whole bunch of kids outside the walls of this church, a whole bunch of kids who come here every Monday through Friday whose parents don't know Jesus. They're never gonna lead them to Jesus. How can we multiply other kids? Think about your coworkers. Think about your family who doesn't know Jesus. How can you purposefully multiply Jesus amongst them? And then what about your good works? You know, sometimes this is a very dangerous thing, is that we want to do things without getting any credit. We, don't, we, we do things anonymously, but there comes a time when we gotta give the credit to somebody. And when people look at us, they need to see 
not what we're doing, but who we're doing it for. Over the next couple of months, we're gonna be looking at doing some service projects outside the walls of this church. And we're gonna do it in the name of North Hills. Maybe even get t-shirts made, maybe even get vests, maybe go. We don't know what all we're gonna do. We're still in the planning phases, but we want to serve our city. And we want our city to see that North Hills loves them. Does that mean we're self-serving? Some people would say yes, but I'm saying I don't want people to see us individually. But what if they saw North Hills and through North Hills they saw Jesus? Could we bring some beauty to the city of Vallejo? And then my challenge for you this week, do something on purpose. A lot of times we go through life and accidents happen and we see beauty come for those accidents. We see somebody who's sick. Is that an accident? And we go see him and, and, and we love them and we bring glory to God through serving them or sharing our faith with them or the family members. When people pass away, there's always that opportunity to, to speak Jesus into them. But what if we did it while people were still alive? What if we did something on purpose this week for Jesus? What if like the butterfly, we simply with boldness just spread our wings and did our butterfly thing? As we follow Jesus, just do our Jesus thing. People are gonna think we're weird? Maybe. But the world needs to see it. They need to see people who love God, who are willing to serve others, and through humility change the world. So as we reflect, what's your purpose? And what are you gonna do about it? Let's take this time to reflect.